the book was never intended to be a book. The book came out because I hung around there, I found it absolutely fascinating. I was a columnist for the Village Voice and I just madly fell in love with my life at the factory and watching everything going on. And I had been up at the factory for six months or so. And Gerard came up to me one day and said, we were wondering when you were going to be writing something about us. <laughs> that made me very paranoid. You know? <laughs> I thought, my God, they're going to like turn me out and not allow me to join in the fun and games anymore. Paul Morrissey gave me the title, the autobiography of Sex by the Underworld. We rushed out the book, and uh, it was the way it was. It was just a bunch of conversations. I didn't explain the people. I didn't say who they were. I didn't give an index. I didn't give an introduction. We all want to know some dish on the sex life of them. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Are you trying to make it with me? Uh, not my type. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll piggyback on this book because I have a book with an agent. In fact, I finished it while Andy was alive. And he said, okay, or you can say whatever you want to about me. <laughs> it's called Son of Andy Warhol, sequel to Son of Frankenstein. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and then uh, well, someone wrote a something about I shot Andy Warhol and, uh, in downtown magazine or something. So I wrote an article, I would have shot Andy <laughs> <laughs> And, uh, but I miss him. Oh, I miss shooting him. I forget, I miss him. <laughs> I want to very briefly lay out a chronology so that we're going to jump around a lot on the panel. Uh, we assume today that Warhol was always famous, uh, not so. This group essentially is part of the factory. Uh, Gerard came into the scene in June 1963, uh, had had silk screening experience, so Andy hired him. Gerard worked continuously with Andy until 1967. Paris on ten dollars a day. London on ten dollars a day. Rome on ten dollars a day. Remember those days? The days of cheap steamship travel across the Atlantic and then looking for a place to stay and a good meal. Andy met Taylor in August of 63 and very shortly after that, Gerard and Taylor and Wynne Chamberlain went across the country for the first big Warhol show at the Ferris Gallery. We arrived and Dennis Hopper gave us a great party with all the, with the uh, uh, Fonda and uh, all kinds of children of the big stars. A wonderful party, and then we, and I insist that we stay at the Beverly Hills Hotel, I was tired of them cheap hotels and it kept taking us. And, <laughs> and so Dennis's wife was Brooke Hayward uh, and her father Leland Hayward, a big uh, Broadway producer. And and uh, it was a World Series was going on and there were no, you couldn't get a room. But uh, Brooke called her father in, D in New York and he gave us his suite at the Beverly Hills. It was also when Andy made his first real uh, semi-story film, Tarzan and Jane Regained, sort of, and that starred Taylor Mead. We shot a lot of uh, some great stuff uh, in a tub with Naomi Levine, me and, uh, me and the, she was my Jane. She followed us out there and we, I said, she cannot be, she's so pushy, we don't want her in this movie. We said, we'll give her a few minutes, and it turned out she was fantastic as Jane. <laughs> and with a great blizzard and everything. It's fair to say that at that time, Taylor was as much a star as Andy Warhol, because he, had, he was the first underground, underground star uh, of Ron Rice's film, The Flower Thief. Andy, he pointed, he pointed to a coconut tree, and I'm Tarzan now, a little thing, and uh, he wants me to climb a tree to get a coconut, and, but I had a stand-in named Dennis Hopper. <laughs> and I, I, I took the script from Andy and tore it up and 
gave uh, Dennis a couple of bucks and called me three of them. I think it's the first time Dennis really relaxed in a movie. I think it helped him tremendously. <laughs> Well, Tarzan and Jane is really one of the most entertaining of the Warhol films. Another one that is very rarely seen is Prison, which starred Bibby Hansen and Edie Sedgwick. And Bibby, I would like <coughs> you to just give some sense what the perspective coming into the factory as a 14-year-old. I, I had been to jail. I was a street kid. I was in a lot of trouble. so. There wasn't really anything going on up there that I had seen. And it was generally a lot calmer than most of the places I had been. <laughs> I was doing the galleries with my father, Al Hansen, who was an artist. And every Saturday, we'd go east on 57th Street and then come up Madison Avenue and end up at Castelli Gallery and then at Starks, uh, like a restaurant bar chain. And I walked in with my dad. And in one corner was Gerard and Andy and Chuck and uh, a bunch of other artists. And my dad and I went and joined them. And somebody bought us a meal, because we very rarely had the price of a restaurant meal on us. Somebody bought us a burger. And, uh, and my dad a beer and me a big chocolate milkshake. And uh, sort of sat around being bored while they were all talking, grown up art talk. And suddenly Andy peered across the table at me and he said, and hey, you, what do you do? <laughs> and uh, so my father piped up, I just sprung her from jail. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I think <laughs> in one breath, uh, both uh, Chuck and Andy said at once, oh, tell us about that. <laughs> and uh, immediately I, I told them some war stories and Andy said, Oh, would you come to the factory and make a movie with, with me about about jail? And I said, Yeah, sure. Love to. When? And and Monday. And I said, Sure. And my father said, No, she can't come on Monday. If she cut, she has to go to school. If she doesn't go to school, they're going to throw her back in jail again. But it was decided that I would come after school. And I came after school on that Monday, and we did not make prison for several weeks or a couple of months after that, but we did make a screen test. I think my first screen test. There's usually a, a point when you're a very young scenester where they're like, dump the kid. Okay, we're going out now, dump the kid. And I, I never really experienced that. I, so many times I was included, so many times I was brought along, and Gerard uh, was incredibly helpful and kind, and uh, as was Andy. I always found it kind of fascinating because it would be a group of us, we'd, we'd meet at somebody's apartment like at 9 or 10 in the evening and everybody was playing records and everybody would then go into little groups, whatever was going on. It was a very kind of intellectual atmosphere to a certain extent. I'd go off in the corner and write some poetry. Uh, I always wondered what these people did though. <laughs> and they seem they seem talented at something, but I couldn't put my finger on it. It was, it was quite because I was sort of a junkie or a drug addict, or something very demi monde or whatever. But this had a different flair to it. It was very unusual. What Andy really did was he received information like nobody I ever met. I mean, to be around the factory, you had to pay some dues. He was very catalytic, pushing people all the time to do something. I mean, even if you're sitting or, or you, you're supposed to be an actor or a superstar, <coughs> the camera is grinding away at whatever it is, $100 a minute, and you don't have any script, you're pretty much obliged to produce. And a lot of people uh, found access by producing information for Andy. I was a columnist at, at The Voice, and then I had my own paper, and I covered the art scene a lot. So I always have lots and lots of things to tell him. And Andy's reaction was usually, really? <laughs> really? <laughs> really? You know? <laughs> and and uh, you learn very quickly not to ask questions, to try and figure out what was going on. I did a play for which I won an OB, a Frank O'Hara play. If you win an OB, if you have a major off-Broadway show, 
with Al Pacino and uh, Dustin Hoffman and so many more. If the play runs, the Hollywood people come down eventually. We had four performances and the director double sold the seats. Disaster. <laughs> and I told Frank O'Hara, but he would become a curator of art at the museum of the moment. And I said, I said, Frank, and Frank was associated with the rich up now in these places. He said, oh, Tanner, what can I do? And was so fucking elegant. <laughs> <laughs> and I knew what I could do. I went, I went to Europe for three years. And Andy, uh, after, I went to Chelsea Girls at the uh, Cinematheque in Paris. And uh, I was with John Jacques LaBelle, who was sort of head of the underground in Paris, uh, until he inherited 400 million. Um, and and uh, they walked out. My French friends walked out. And I said, I said, what the hell am I doing in La Dolce Vita land? They don't know that's for real. New York. No two takes. And, uh, but they couldn't believe it. And uh, I said, and then Andy said, oh, Taylor, we've got so many parts for you. You know, Hollywood. So you got to come back. Andy was making promises like crazy. He'd tell you anything. And I came back, and the day I got off the plane, Andy had me doing an imitation of Christ uh, out of the docks and everything. And uh, the next day, I ran into Mickey Ruskin, who ran the, uh, the call room of, of the young <laughs> artists in Manchester, Kansas City, at 17th and Park Avenue in the South, now in Delhi. And he said, he said, Taylor, I've got this great place you fit right in. That did it. Maxwell's Kansas City. I've lived there for weeks, months, years. <laughs> Owned the thousands. I know a quarter of a million to the McNally brothers and uh, Cipriani's and well, you know, I gotta live. Spoiled. <laughs> <laughs> Everything was so baffling. You could never figure out what was happening. I mean, one day he brought up a horse in the freight elevator. They were going to make a western. And he had all these <laughs> young, charming boys leaping on and off it, some with black hats and leaping on and off the horse. But the horse was stationed in front of the crate elevator. And every time somebody came up in the elevator, they walked through the movie. And every time the phone rang, somebody had to walk into the movie and answer the phone on the wall. We may not think of the, how important the amphetamine scene was at that time. I was, well, that was a subculture. That was, yeah. The amphetamine scene was a kind of ancillary or a subculture to the underground culture that Andy seemed to surround himself with. And uh, I, I indulged in that for a while. I, I used to hang out. I, in fact, I even gave it a name, the Dawn Patrol, <laughs> um, only because we'd be up all night and stumble into the street, and then we would we would go directly to the the uh, the diner that was on the corner of Lafayette and Bond Street, uh, sadly gone. And it was always something that took place after hours from the factory. And, and a number of the people in the group were also people who were in a lot of Andy's films. Uh, so there was a crossover between the synthetic subculture and. Um, and uh, the Andy Warhol uh, art and film scene. I mean, do you think part of that is people on amphetamine talk amazingly, and Andy wanted that? Well, I used to call that amphetamine rapture. That was another <laughs> term I came up with. And uh, yes, that's very true. The pe uh, people who were on amphetamine would, would get into a rap, you know, and be talking constantly. And that, that's something that Andy was attracted to uh, uh, for his sound movies. If people ask you to try and explain it, which all 20 people in my book are not able to do in, in whatever it is, 30, 40,000 words, it's very hard to explain it. But uh, we'd established that among the influences behind Andy were Marcel Duchamp and Picasso and Salvador Dali. And I said to David, I said, well, who do you think that um, that Andy's influence, he said, everybody.